Welcome back from our uh, short break. Wait for our you know, interpreter to get on. All right. All right. Um, our next panel is entitled Strong Supply Chains, Opportunities to Thwart Shortages. Vaccine shortages can result from higher than expected demand, interruptions in production or supply, other logistical issues, or lack of resources to purchase vaccines. The current shortage of Bay Fortis in the United States is caused by both unexpected demand and logistical issues. In this session, the speakers will discuss opportunities to increase equitable supply and how we can work collectively to prevent shortages. These presentations will help to support the work of the Innovation and Immunization Subcommittee. In this session, we'll hear from Dr. Manuel Osorio from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Joe Figlio from the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, Drs. Tanya Villafana and Iskra Rick from AstraZeneca, and Dr. Zini Santoli from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Dr. Osorio, get your slides up. Your slides are up, uh, and uh, I see you. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, for giving me the opportunity to, to um, participate in this panel um, discussion today. Um, I would like to present some slides to provide you with a very high level um, overview of some of the activities at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA. And these are activities that could potentially uh, address uh, some of the drug shortages that we've experienced. In particular, I would like to tell you about um, activities uh, in, in, in CBER uh, to help promote the development and adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies. And this is an area that um, uh, it's, a great, it's of great interest to the center because implementing innovations in manufacturing um, can help um, address some of the issues that are associated with, with drug shortages or that are, that are causing uh, drug shortages. And some, some of these um, 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 sort of opportunities um, in implementing um, advanced manufacturing technologies is the ability to rapidly scale manufacturing capabilities for vaccines or other medical countermeasures to respond faster to emerging threats and other public health emergencies. Also, um, um, implementation of these technologies can shorten supply chains and increase manufacturing resilience to, to disruption by emerging threats or public health emergencies, such as natural disasters. And this can be done by creating a distributed network of, of small manufacturing sites that can provide um, uh, um, reserve capacity for, 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 um, for manufacturing at the areas where they're most needed. Um, also, in innovations in manufacturing can enhance product quality, that, therefore reducing uh, some of the quality-related drug shortages that we have experienced in the past. Uh, so, can, can you move to the next slide, please? So, in 2019, uh, second half of 2019, uh, CBER established the CBER Advanced Technologies Program. Under this program, we have uh, three major um, initiatives that are shown uh, here on the slide. The first one is to fund advanced research and development projects. Um, these are extramural projects, uh, mostly at uh, academic institutions. And the purpose for doing this is to support regulatory science and, and innovation. Uh, since uh, 2019, the, the center has funded about 23 uh, uh, projects um, about one third of those are for um, developing uh, or, or facilitating advances in manufacturing for, for vaccines. Uh, and this would be COVID vaccines. This could be related to uh, uh, influenza vaccines. Also, in, in CBER, we, under this program, we, we have an, the initiative to build the internal scientific and regulatory expertise that is gonna be required to uh, evaluate this innovative approaches to manufacturing. So these are um, uh, technologies such as some of the ones that I mentioned are distributed manufacturing. This could be technologies such as uh, continuous ma manufacturing, uh, the implementation of artificial intelligence in the manufacturing process uh, um, and, and, and this type of technologies. 
Um, and, and, and also we're doing this, we're building the scientific and regulatory expertise through the projects that we're supporting externally by giving our, our staff um, access to those findings and, and, and uh, also possibility to, to visit these um, um, academic institutions where these uh, projects are being developed. Um, and also we, we have opportunities for training through the Cyber Advanced Technologies Team uh, engagements, uh, which are, uh, is the next uh, activity that's listed on the slide. And I'll go into more details about that. So um, the, the Cyber Advanced Technologies Team, um, it, it's a mechanism by which the center provides an opportunity for engagement to technology developers at an early stage to come to the center and to discuss with us uh, potential scientific as well, as well as regulatory issues that may be associated with the implementation of these technologies in, in the manufacturing sector. Um, so with regards to some of the projects that we have funded over the years, I just wanted to highlight one, which is uh, shown in the next slide. If you can move uh, to the next slide, please. And so this is a project that um, we, um, awarded um, uh, a contract for this project in uh, FY22 to the to MIT for the development of an integrated continuous CGMP facility for mRNA manufacturing. Um, so the projects of this goal of the of this project are the, the project the goals of the project are to enable an end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing of mRNA vaccines by developing uh, new technology approaches, right? And that involves developing the the process of analytical technology that, that is required to, to ensure a fully continuous end-to-end -end manufacturing process. Uh, included in that would be also building a digital twin model for, for the entire process. And so the, the significance of this project is that if su su successful, it will provide a flexible, efficient, and advanced manufacturing platform to allow, to allow rapid consistent production of mRNA vaccines but not just uh, mRNA-based vaccines. It could also be uh, mRNA-based products for other um, um, diseases. Um, and also at the same time, as I mentioned before, this, is, this will provide an opportunity uh, to advance regulatory science by providing knowledge and experience to CBER staff in this specific uh, technology. Um, so in the next slide, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the, the CAP program. And so, as I mentioned before, CAP was established to, to allow um, uh, technology developers to um, access to, to the center to discuss um, um, the implementation of these innovative technologies. Um, and, and these um, interactions occur at an early stage of development uh, prior to um, the definition of a specific product, so that the discussions are mostly focused on on the technology, uh, not on the specific product. So we we do have other types of meetings uh, that the center offers for uh, product specific discussions. Something that is not listed on the uh, under the program that the, where they show the three different initiatives is is um, we are um, seeing a lot of more activities in terms of policy development, uh, and so. Through this Cyber Advanced Technologies Program, we're also involved in coordinating uh, some of the um, policy initiatives to develop the, the regulatory framework that is going to be necessary to evaluate these um, uh, advanced technologies. Through these efforts, too, uh, uh, we are uh, coordinating effort through coordinating activities to harmonize uh, internationally on regulatory requirements for evaluating these technologies. Um, so that's, um, I think, is there, is there another slide? I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, this was just to show you some of the, 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 the technologies that we discussed through these programs. And these include, um, you know, the ones that are relevant to vaccines that are continuous manufacturing for vaccines, uh, improved cell lines for vaccine antigen production, uh, multi-product manufacturing design, where you can have uh, multiple products being manufactured in the same ballroom, and these uh, um, manufacturing activities can can change depending on demand. So that, that's uh, some some of the new technologies that are being implemented, and we're discussing those uh, those with the manufacturers to try to address the potential regulatory issues that are associated with those. 
Um, and, and that's all I have. Like, um, you know, we, we are really, uh, we think that advanced manufacturing um, uh, holds a lot of promise in addressing some of the drug shortages that we have experienced. And so we are trying to see how, what, you know, what areas need help that we can uh, advance in order to um, um, uh, facilitate uh, the, the availability of uh, much needed medicines when they're needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosario. Our next presenter is Mr. Joe Figlio from ASPER. Uh, Mr. Figlio, your slides are up. I see your face. You have the floor. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? You're loud and clear. Excellent. Thank you. Um, glad to be here today with you. Uh, I'd rather, much rather be in person with everyone, uh, perhaps next time. The uh, reason I say that is I have about an hour's worth of work going on at my house today. It happens to be going on right now in this one hour window. And also my both of my neighbors are having work done on their houses. So I I think I have a little bit of a quiet window here. So forgive me if you hear too much noise in the background, but I think we're good. Um, so let's see, let's, if we could jump to the next slide again, Joe Figlio, I've been in Fort Barda since 2009 during uh, the H1N1 pandemic is when I joined. Um, and I'm in the PCI group, which is currently the Pharmaceutical Countermeasures and Infrastructure Division. Uh, so this is a slide we like to start off with. Um, I think this started or uh, was created for our BARDA Industry Day back in November of 2023. Um, so just a quick look at pre-COVID and where we stood with the public health industrial base uh, and with a specific focus on, you know, vaccine and therapeutics manufacturing. Um, Pre-COVID, you know, many companies were in a just-in-time operating mode. You know, you didn't didn't want to. It wasn't financially sound to keep a lot of inventory on hand. Um, a lot of uh, down the bottom there, you can see gloves, syringes, needles, things like that came from Asia and other parts of the world, uh, as well as a lot of generic drugs, as you know, coming in from other countries. Uh, during the peak of COVID-19 response, um, as, as you can imagine, there you know an incredible amount of uh, supply chain shortages and problems all throughout the manufacturing process from the very beginning all the way through uh, delivery. You know there were problems with things like cardboard and paper towards the end. Um, so we we were transporting materials from other parts of the world, uh, ships, planes for the most part, uh, and for quite a long time. I can only imagine how many flights uh, were coming back and forth to bring supplies into the U.S. during that response. Jumping ahead to today, which I know is not exactly October 2023, we're into uh, February 24 now, um, and the demand and supply is stabilizing, right? The COVID cliff has happened and things have dropped off considerably. However, as soon as this week, as recent as this week, um, we had an issue with uh, and it's still continuing, uh, things like electrical switch gear. Uh, so other, other components used to build new facilities, uh, the biggest uh, lead time item now is electrical switch gear and other electrical components. So that is still one of the top lingering issues in the supply chain that we see. Um, jumping ahead to the future, and what we hope to do is continue and complete some of the projects we're working on that I will get into in a little, few more slides. Uh, but also build more partnerships and you know with some of our key suppliers so that we can plan better for the for the next event. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a uh, more or less a, a picture of some key literature, right? Um, you know, the American pandemic preparedness, top left, uh, transforming our capabilities. Um, Bottom right was a big one for us, the executive order on advancing biotechnology and manufacturing innovation. Um, but focusing on the two highlighted in the middle here, uh, the, our ASPR strategic plan, um, which BARDA is a part of ASPR, and then the BARDA strategic plan, both from 2022 to 2026. Um, I'm going to touch on a few things at a higher level, really, that is more related to our ASPR organization as a whole. And then I'm gonna focus in on some more BARDA specifics in the last few slides. So next slide, please. Okay, actually, if we could go back one. There we go, thank you. 
So just focusing on the ASPR strategic plan for a minute. Um, again, the ASPR mission to assist the country in preparing for responding to and recovering from public health emergencies and disasters, including uh, developing and stockpiling and distributing uh, response tools against multiple threats, sending clinical response teams to places in times of crisis, uh, ensuring our healthcare and public health partners have the knowledge and tools they need to navigate today's challenges and confront whatever challenges lie ahead. Um, again, the key, key goals in the ASPR strategic plan, which do mirror BARDA's goals, or the other way around, BARDA's goals mirror the ASPR goals. Uh, goal one, protecting national security uh, through preparedness for new and emerging infectious diseases. Goal two, diverse portfolio of response capabilities. Uh, goal three, ensuring workforce readiness. And goal four, improving and leveraging partnerships. Now, last point on some high-level ASPR items and some new, uh, I guess, organizations within ASPR or organizations that grew considerably within ASPR during the pandemic. Uh, the Strategic National Stockpile, uh, as we know, you know, was in the spotlight for quite a while during the pandemic. Uh, the capabilities have grown considerably and they're continuing to. Uh, the Supply, supply Chain Control Tower, uh, HCORE, which is a HCORE is what used to be Operation Warp Speed, which then became the CAG, the Countermeasures Acceleration Group, and then now is HCORE, which is a permanent group within the ASPR organization. Uh, and as well as the Biomap organization, which is a component within BARDA, within the PCI division, um, which we've heard more about at our recent uh, BARDA Industry Day, and uh, there's plenty of information available. That's being stood up now to address future, um, you know, response, response and partnerships in a consortium manner. Uh, okay, next slide, please. And I almost forgot the Office of Industrial-Based Management and Supply Chain, which is another new group within the ASPR organization. Uh, there has been a lot of overlap between IBMSC, that last group I mentioned, BARDA and HCORE early on, but now their roles of each are kind of becoming more defined. Um, okay, next, uh, this slide is fine, thank you. Um, so looking at our PCI division, um, you know, we have our key focus areas of product development, product process expertise, strengthening the industry partnerships and capacity infrastructure contracts. This third one is where I'd like to focus the rest of my few minutes on. If you could jump to the next slide, please. Okay, so what we did during the pandemic with funding that came through for COVID response, uh, we're charged with mitigating bottlenecks for pandemic vaccine surge demand. Um, the categories included the, the six that you see below here, vials, single-use technologies such as bags, tubing assemblies, raw materials needed, especially for things like mRNA vaccines, uh, sterilization capacity, needles and syringes used to administer the vaccine, and fill finish capability, which we always have known that would be a bottleneck in a surge event where you're trying to fill as many vaccines as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, here is just kind of another overview. We had 20 plus uh, projects. Uh, the majority of these projects are still in progress. As you know, it takes many years to build this cap capabilities, whether it's new or renovated buildings. Um, but the goal was to eliminate or reduce the need on foreign sourced materials. Um, all of our needles and syringe projects are completed. Uh, some of our vials projects are halfway to completion, and some of the others are still underway. Um, let's go to the next slide as I'm keeping track of our time. Here is a, a better picture of each of those categories that I mentioned. Uh, needles and syringes, we had three projects. Fill finished, six ongoing projects. Vials, four agreements. You can see the below each one of these, the dollar value uh, for that category of item and as well as the capacity next to that the next number to the right of the dollars is the capacity of added uh, capacity i believe it's all on an annual basis right uh, single-use technologies as you may know big part of 
uh, vaccine manufacturing disposables, uh, and that became a bottleneck. Uh, you could have uh, the material that is used to make a bag, for instance, in manufacturing. Um, the film would come from one country, the bag would be assembled in another country and manufactured there, and then it would be shipped to the United States. So that that was something that occurred on a regular basis. Um, and then, of course, critical raw materials, as I mentioned, particularly for, but not exclusively for, uh, the mRNA vaccines. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and I sped up and got to the end, uh, roughly about the right amount of time. I'll uh, stop there, and I believe we have time for questions uh, towards the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finkley. I appreciate uh, your presentation. Our next presenters are Drs. Tanya Villafana and Iskra Rake. Um, uh, doctors, your, your slides are up. I see you uh, on the, on the uh, video. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks, first of all, for the opportunity uh, to participate. And uh, if you can just move on the next slide, the objective that uh, my colleague Tony Avilofana and myself have today is to share the, or at least try to share the AstraZeneca perspective on the developing stable, sustainable, and resilient supply chain uh, for public health. And also kind of our, our views and insights of why we believe that partnership and collaborations are absolutely key in order to, to get there. And I hope that, you know, what we heard from, from other panelists, it's, it's, it's really kind of building up and rounding the, the, the topic around the partnership and what, what needs to be critical for ensuring the strong supply chains. So in summary, we basically see three areas where, uh, where, where, where that we believe are critical to prevent uh, immunization related shortages. The, the area number one would be the acceleration or our ability to accelerate in, in the way how we establish supply chains and supply networks. The second uh, would be the preparation for, from, and we can look at from the different perspective and how to ensure that proper planning is in place to have the, the proper uptake of the immunization, whether we are talking about active or passive immunization. And then the third area would be around our flexibility or our agility to respond quickly to the unpredictable and rapidly changing environment. And I'm sure we will all agree that that's the environment we are operating in. And throughout the presentation, we will try to share a few examples on these three critical areas. But before we dive the, uh, into these three examples, and if you can go to the next slide, let me just spend a moment uh, to share the kind of where are we coming from and what is our commitment to the public health and ambition to develop and deliver the transformative vaccines and antibodies in order to provide long lasting immunity and eventually impact the overall public uh, public health. In delivering that ambition, we, we find kind of three areas that are quite important for us. Uh, I, I think the first one is really kind of how we think about prioritizing pathogens where there is a significant burden of disease and potential pandemic threat. And here we are obviously more than happy to kind of look at the, the World Health Organization priority list and really make sure that we are kind of picking up those where the, the need is the, 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 the strongest or the biggest. And then in order to do that, uh, we're also thinking about how to make sure that the approach is equitable. So you, you kind of be, we don't miss anybody. And here I'm particularly talking about the vulnerable population, because if you think about the immunocompromised, the infants or the elderly, it is clear that many of them cannot be protected simply by, by vaccination or, or by you know, applying and ensuring the active immunization is available. And, and therefore, one of the very important uh, uh, focus uh, from our perspective is, is kind of how to make sure that we don't uh, let any patient behind and how we can use the highly targeted long-acting monoclonal antibodies to kind of uh, protect uh, those most vul vulnerable population through the passive immunization. And, and you can see on the slide the number of, number of the example. Evershield was the only long-acting long monoclonal antibody 
uh, that protected immunocompromised pa patients during during COVID for a reasonable amount of time, given unpredictability of the COVID environment, as well as before to for infants for uh, protection of RSV. The third area is, you know, how we think about next generation platforms, uh, specifically for a va vaccine that can actually help us to improve both uptake and access of the vaccination. And then the fourth area is, is kind of thinking forward and kind of what are the, uh, what are the potential uh, sources of the next pandemic, if you want. And I think many would agree that the growing challenge of antimicrobial resistance is definitely on that list. So kind of how we think about that and how we, you know, get ready and, and prepare for the for the next pot potential pandemic in that uh, in that area. So let us now spend a few minutes in kind of sharing a few examples for um, uh, on, on acceleration uh, preparation, planning, and the flexibility for the stable and sustainable supply chain. So, Tony, over to you. Great. Thank you, Eska. And thanks again, everyone, for uh, the opportunity to uh, present uh, to you today. So, as Eska has noted, I'm going to um, focus on three examples, um, hitting on the themes uh, that she uh, illustrated for us. So, if we go to the next slide, please. So the first example we'd like to touch on, and again, tying back to the previous uh, speakers, is how we accelerated to develop and deliver uh, the COVID-19 vaccine in collaboration with Oxford University at no profit uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And here we conducted a global clinical program enrolling more than 65,000 volunteers in over 20 clinical trials in more than 15 countries. So we had a very robust approach to scale up and do clinical trials quite rapidly to get uh, to the vaccine. When we talk about creating uh, stable supply chains in parallel, we built a network of more than 25 supply partners in over 15 countries across the globe. And this network for us included regional approaches to minimize transport and import constraints. And we took the risk to do the scale up of manufacturing ahead of approvals or ahead of readouts from the clinical trials that I just described to make sure that we could deliver the COVID uh, vaccine as soon as possible. We initiated techn uh, uh, technology transfers in uh, all of, uh, regions around the world, um, building strong capabilities. And we looked at countries like Brazil and Thailand where we um, could use that infrastructure to apply uh, to, future, to future applications. The approach uh, required global agreements to be secured with governments and NGOs so that we could supply the vaccine globally. And the not-for-profit approach meant that we could offer governments and NGOs around the world an affordable option for a COVID-19 vaccine, which was critically needed uh, during the pandemic. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, you could see what this ultimately resulted in. We were able to supply or deliver more than 3 billion doses of vaccine with this approach, scaling up our supply um, in parallel to conducting our clinical studies. And independent experts have said about 6 million lives were saved during the first 12 months of use uh, for, um, uh, for COVID with the vaccine. We were able to supply to 180 countries around the world and more than two thirds of those uh, vaccines went to low and middle income countries. So uh, this we think is a, is a great example that could be modeled in the future of how one can accelerate uh, to meet supply challenges, to meet uh, regional and logistic challenges, um, to supply uh, globally during a pandemic. I'll move to the second example on the next slide. And here I want to touch on the theme of uh, preparation. And uh, this is really about how we have prepared for the rollout of Bay Fortis. Um, which, as Iskra mentioned, is the first immunization to protect all infants from lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV. Um, Bayfortis, as you know, is the first monoclonal antibody to be delivered as a routine pediatric passive immunization. So this is really groundbreaking uh, space, being able to deliver a monoclonal antibody um, like we would normally uh, deliver a, a routine pediatric immunization. We developed Bayfortis over a decade, and that uh, we did that in partnership with, uh, with Sanofi, and really benefited, as you can see from the left-hand side uh, on this slide, from early engagement with regulata regulators and recommending bodies. And that was critical for us, um, getting a positive advisory uh, committee review 
as well as ACIP recommendations and coverage in the Vaccine for, for Children program. Again, this was unprecedented uh, work done by the partnership to be able to get a monoclonal antibody uh, into the system very much like you would uh, have a vaccine. The novel approach required years of prep to ensure that we had scale, that we could meet the scale and that we would have broad uh, deployment of the, of the antibody. Manufacturing an antibody can take up to 12 months to complete um, with numerous steps, uh, including creation of the drug substance, so where we need to secure raw materials like, like the other speakers uh, were, were referencing, uh, creation of the drug product, which requires fill finished capacity, and securing components or enough components such as syringes, stoppers, and needles, um, which we need to, to have on hand to be able to um, uh, have the drug product. We delivered uh, this season 2 million uh, doses of Bay Fortis globally. So we, we actually delivered uh, more than we had an anticipated or we were asked to uh, deliver um, by initial uh, demand forecast. Um, and the complex process that has to, we have to undergo to ensure demand is met um, needs significant advanced planning, as I mentioned before. Um, the unprecedented demand that we've seen uh, in Bay Fortis in the US has thus required us to ensure that we're planning um, to increase supply and meet demand and scale up of production is on the way for the next season um, where we would uh, have Bay Fortis implemented. So I'm talking about the 24, uh, 25 season uh, right now. And our ability to do this is really uh, dependent on the collaboration um, and partnership with uh, Sanofi, our partner, um, and also, as you can see on the side, the White House, FDA, CDC, and other stakeholders in this process to ensure um, that we could meet the, the needs fully um, for the next season. If we go to the next example that we'd like to cover, and here the theme is really about flexibility. And this has been already alluded to in the context of how we respond um, with a changing variant landscape, for example, with COVID-19, um, where we need to constantly respond as variants of concern um, emerge. Um, as Eskra mentioned before, immunocompromised individuals mount suboptimal responses to COVID vaccines, and therefore having monoclonal antibodies as a, an important tool that could provide protection to these groups is critically important. Um, we know that the monoclonal antibodies that were discovered early on in the pandemic have lost activity so we, to, the, to the newer variants, which necessitates the ongoing development of new monoclonal antibodies, um, such as the next generation uh, monoclonal antibody that we're currently developing, Sepavibar. We will need to continue to develop new monoclonal antibodies as, as more variants of concern continue to emerge. And we can use technologies to do this more rapidly and efficiently. So as one of the speakers before uh, referenced, you know, the ability for us to use our generative AI, for example, to design newly broadly uh, neutralizing antibodies in silico and then making and testing them, uh, the top candidates in the lab is, is an approach that we're looking to, to do. But while we do that, and in order to make that a, a viable and sustainable strategy, we need to um, have novel regulatory and clinical frameworks that allow the rapid assessment, authorization, and approval. Um, for example, the ability to use immunobridging techniques where we're able to bridge back to earlier efficacy studies done um, with these new monoclonal antibodies uh, that we develop is really critical. And so then uh, really um, involves collaboration with regulators quite uh, closely to ensure this environment uh, is established. In order to maintain supply, we have to invest in manufacturing capacity as well and supply networks that maximize the lifespan of the monoclonal antibodies as we bring them forward in this case, but also to ensure that the new monoclonal antibodies can be rapidly scaled in order to address this unmet need in this changing variant landscape. So I hope with that, uh, we've been able to touch on these three different themes with three different examples of how we work to, to ensure a stable supply uh, for public health. And with that, I'll turn over to Iska. Thanks, Tonya. <clears throat> and I really hope that uh, the examples Tonya shared speak to the to the point we are trying to make that you know we, we cannot be successful in this if we don't ensure that there is a clear public 
private partnership that includes health authorities, advisory committees, government, academia, and industry. And, and, and I think the, the message here is that this is really absolutely critical to, to achieve goals that, that are related to the uh, broad pandemic or pandemic supply chain and improvement of the public health and the, at the end. And if you go to the next slide, we try to summarize four <clears throat> kind of uh, uh, final messages or four areas where we believe and, and examples you heard from Tonya of really showing where this partnership would be really critical. And I think you heard enough today about the, the need for the for the regulatory pathways. I think uh, 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 a few speakers mentioned that you know we are we, we, we are living in a in a fantastic time where we are really able to deliver clinical trials with speed using the new technologies. But again, it doesn't mean anything if the regulatory pathways are not kind of following uh, following that uh, that opportunity, the second important piece is the the kind of alignment or the partnering around uh, the the clarity of the recommendation for both passive and active immun immunization that has to support broad and fast and equitable access and and this is something that again goes under the planning. Uh, uh, part where we really need to kind of think about that upfront and making sure that we do everything that that's, that happens when, uh, mm -hmm. when 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 the proper time. And then if you look at the, the the point number three, I think we all agree today, and that's why this topic is 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 a key to this panel. The supply is the the critical piece, and I think we learn, if nothing else, than during COVID, that uh, we need to find a way to partner and kind of risk share if you want in order to ensure available supply supply infrastructure. And that goes from capacity, specifically, obviously, for the biologic product that, as you all know, it's it's quite complex, but then also to the components. And I think you heard an issues we are facing from, 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 from other panelists today already. And then the last, but definitely not least, is, you know, if you think about uh, about uh, uh, you know how to make sure we deliver on the on the public health priorities. We need to make sure that the industry and public stakeholders are aligned upfront on the burden, demand, the need, if you want, but then also uh, monitoring. So we are we are you know we, we all feel um, confident that we will be able to deliver against the public uh, public health goals and priorities we set. For ourselves. So let me stop here and thank everybody for attention and happy to answer any questions or hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dreig and Dr. Vilafana. Uh, our final presenter in this panel is Dr. Jeannie Santoli from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And Dr. Santoli, your slides are up. Dr. Santoli lost connection to the oh, meeting, goodness. but is currently relogging in. Okay. Yeah, for just a moment. Are there any burning questions that anybody has for our other panelists while we're waiting for Dr. Santoli to get back on? Uh, Rob Schechter, go ahead, Rob. Thank you, and, and thanks to the panelists. I, I had a question for the AstraZeneca team. Um, in thinking about nirsevimab production for this initial season, um, to what degree were production limitations an issue versus concerns about overproduction and the financial risk of overproduction? And if it was the latter, if there was a concern about overproduction and, and wastage, what would have been helpful to to your partnership with uh, Sanofi in trying to um, uh, hedge against that risk or avert against that risk to err on the side of adequate supply for the nation? Thank you. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can start, and then Tonya, please feel free to add. So th thanks for the question, and I think it's a, it's a good one, and it's definitely you know we try to kind of reflect that in the examples we share. I think when you think when I think kind of backwards, I do believe that the point around you know proper planning and aligning on the kind of burden of the disease 
um, our ability to organize and plan for the proper uptake and then have the alignment between all the key stakeholders would definitely allow us to 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 ensure that kind of we foresee and forecast for the for the supply that can meet the demand i think this is this was a perfect situation that i i think we can we can definitely learn from when you have the unprecedented demand that was underestimated by uh by by all if you want uh, stakeholders and then our on one side good news is our ability to kind of you know try to 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 fix it and 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 run fast and you know by aligning all different stakeholders manage to to deliver you know number of times more than initially planned or, or or ordered but equally i think it's a great learning for us to think about how we can do how we can plan better and how we can plan better in the in the in the public private partnership manner to to make sure that we are able to 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 supply the demand of such an important uh, drug to protect the infants in this specific case but obviously it can be applied to any other uh, uh, need specifically for the for the vulnerable population. I don't know, Tony, if you if you want to add the the perspective. Yeah, no, yeah, not nothing uh, more to add really. But the there's another partner in this, and I think you know Jeannie will will talk. But obviously, um, getting all of those uh, predictions uh, right with the CDC is is critical. And so I think you know again it, it illustrates the point that we made before working closely together across all the stakeholders. Um, you know, on the industry side, but also um, in partnership with uh, with the government. All right, thank you all, and thank you, Rob, for the question. We'll now move to uh, uh, Dr. Jeannie Santoli from CDC. Jeannie, your slides are up. Uh, I see you. Uh, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Thanks for um, having me today. I wanted to give sort of a very brief overview of the role that CDC has traditionally played in uh, managing and supporting uh, operations during national vaccine shortages. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about how we monitor supply and efforts at communication and coordination, and then we'll review some strategies for mitigating vaccine shortages. Then we'll walk through just a few recent examples. Next slide. Um, CDC purchases vaccines for its routine programs using contracts for pediatrics and adults. So this includes we've got flu vaccine contracts, COVID-19 vaccine contracts, and then contracts for the other vaccines that are used. And each contract includes a requirement for manufacturers to provide um, advance notice of vaccine supply issues as soon as they become aware that they will have an inability to fill orders timely. Uh, the contracts also require manufacturers in the event of a shortage to demonstrate reasonably equal treatment between the public and private sectors. And so with these requirements, um, CDC is provided with some visibility about upcoming issues and also is able to set expectations about equity between the public and private sectors when there is a supply constraint. Next slide. Now, once CDC receives notification from a manufacturer about an anticipated problem, we then seek permission to share confidential information with manufacturers of alternative products who may be in a position to mitigate the situation. So the information is quite limited. It's sort of need to know information such as the size of the gap and the anticipated time frame of the gap. Um, and the information that's shared is really for just internal discussions among key planning staff. It's not to be shared widely within the company and it's not to be made public. Um, we also maintain a regular point of contact uh, and communicate as needed with CBER's product shortage coordinator. And CDC staff meet with um, stakeholders to review and update messaging and that includes provider organizations, public health organizations, FDA colleagues, and CDC uh, disease subject matter experts. And then lastly, we maintain a public facing web page on which we post information about supply shortages of routinely recommended vaccines. Next slide. And this just shows you a screenshot of that website, which we update um, on a on a as needed basis. Next slide. 
Next, I just wanted to talk about a few strategies for mitigating a vaccine shortage. The first strategy involves the Pediatric Vaccine Stockpile Program. This is part of the Vaccines for Children program, and it allows CDC to use VFC funding to purchase and manage stockpiles. Uh, the stockpiles are dynamic storage and rotation stockpiles. They're held by the manufacturer so they can rotate through manufacturer inventory, and that ensures vaccine viability in the stockpile, and it reduces waste. The target size for the stockpile is defined as a six-month supply of VFC vaccine usage, and the stockpile contracts that we have with manufacturers allow us to loan stockpiled vaccines to them to mitigate shortages, and vaccines are then replaced following the shortage. Next slide. A second strategy is controlled vaccine ordering. So when supply is reduced, CDC implements ordering controls in the public sector to mitigate the effects of the shortage. And these controls place limits on the total number of vaccines that each jurisdiction can order. And jurisdictions are then responsible for making important decisions about how much vaccine will be made available to individual providers and to provider types. Ordering limits are calculated to facilitate jurisdictions having an access to an equitable share of the vaccine or product that's available. And so they actually mirror the relative proportions of each jurisdiction's ordering for similar vaccines and or similar cohorts when supplies are not constrained. Manufacturers also often implement ordering controls in the private sector. The approach that they use varies by manufacturer, and it also takes into account direct ordering as well as ordering through wholesalers and distributors. Next slide. Finally, um, if there's insufficient vaccine available to fulfill ACIP's recommended vaccination schedule, then interim vaccine recommendations can be issued by CDC. And an interim vaccine recommendation is a temporary change in the recommended schedule that's made to conserve limited supply. Recommendations may either temporarily target limited supply to high-risk individuals or may reduce the number of doses in a multi-dose series, for example. The recommendations, as you can imagine, take some time to implement because providers have to learn about and adapt to a new schedule. And then once the shortage has resolved, you need dedicated communication and outreach to ensure that providers know they can resume the original recommendations. Next. Next slide. Um, in the last few minutes, I just wanted to review three national vaccine shortages that have impacted the routine program. Next slide. So adult hepatitis A, this shortage um, started in 2017 and the underlying cause was large simultaneous outbreaks of hepatitis A among adults um, particularly including those experiencing homelessness in several U.S. cities and states. The outbreaks and the public health vaccination campaigns that were implemented to address them resulted in significant increase in demand, which was well above the routine usage of this vaccine. It's an adult-only product, so it's not held in CDC's stockpile, so we weren't able to use the stockpile as a strategy but the actions taken included frequent communication and collaboration with both U.S. licensed manufacturers of adult hepatitis A vaccine to share information about ordering patterns and ordering controls in the public and private sectors and to ensure that we remained aligned. Um, one of the manufacturers during this period identified an option by which they could significantly increase their U.S. supply of this vaccine in the near term. So that was a, a very important uh, strategy. In addition, CDC provided technical assistance to public health officials in jurisdictions with outbreaks to help them in targeting doses. And then CDC implemented ordering controls in the public sector to support these ongoing outbreak responses and to maintain availability nationally. And the manufacturers also implemented ordering controls. Next slide. Um, going to 2018, there was an, an important shortage of zoster vaccine and the un underlying cause of this shortage 
was higher than anticipated levels of demand that followed a preferential recommendation for this newly licensed zoster vaccine from GSK. The result was extended vaccine supply constraints that began shortly after launch. Here again, this is an adult only product, so it's not held in stockpile, but a number of actions were taken, including steps on the part of the manufacturer to increase production and packaging capabilities. And there was even some delays to non-US launches to support demand in the US. CDC provided guidance to emphasize the importance of the second dose in the series to make sure people were completing the series, even though there was a shortage, and to reiterate that the series didn't need to be restarted if the recommended interval between doses had been exceeded. CDC also implemented ordering controls in the public sector. The manufacturer did the same in the private sector. And again, this was to facilitate equity across jurisdictions and across different customer segments. Next slide. So more recently, Nersevimav, um, the, the underlying cause of this shortage was that the demand for this product exceeded the quantity that had been planned for the first season. Um, there was not enough vaccine available at launch, which is when demand was the highest, um, particularly for the 100 milligram presentation, which was especially constrained. Now, as a new product, Nersevimab is not yet held in CDC stockpile, so stockpile was not an option here, but a number of actions were taken. Um, you just heard about some of this, but there was collaboration between the USG and the manufacturers to manage orders and increase national supply. And this collaboration occurred at multiple levels of, of all of the involved organizations. And you know, remarkably, an additional 300,000 doses were made available in the public and private sectors during that for this first season. And that actually reflected a 30% increase over what was planned and was very important in trying to meet some of the unanticipated demand. And then discussions which were ongoing, included a major focus on planning for the next season, because while there was an, a goal to manage the current season as, as best as possible, it was understood that starting to plan early for the next season was a key strategy. CDC provided guidance on prioritizing nirsevimab in mid-October with a focus on the 100 milligram presentation that was most constrained. And then ordering controls were implemented in the public and private sectors to facilitate equity across the country because initial ordering was significantly varied and uneven across different parts of the country. Next slide. So wrapping up, um, you know, vaccine supply constraints and shortages, we only went over a few here, but they are not infrequent. There are multiple different underlying causes and sometimes multiple causes even for a given shortage. And CDC plays a role in supporting the management and mitigation of supply issues through monitoring, communication, and coordination, maintaining and leveraging pediatric vaccine stockpiles as part of the VFC program, implementing ordering controls in the public sector to facilitate equity, and when necessary, issuing interim vaccine recommendations for providers. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Santoli. And I want to thank all the members of this panel. Uh, are there any questions or comments uh, from the members of the committee for our panels? Uh, Rob Schechter, uh, go ahead, Rob. Oh, thank you again, and, and want to thank the panel for their thoughtful presentations. Um, I guess uh, thinking about uh, going through this recent season with Nersevimab, um, I'm wondering about the the information that was used to gauge demand uh, to to base production decisions, and I'm wondering. Uh, thinking about all the consumer survey consumer surveys that were done by Kaiser Family Foundation and others around COVID vaccine over the last few years, to what degree there are parallel resources to um, accurately gauge 
parental, consumer, family, uh, individual demand for new vaccines um, to inform production decisions going forward. Rob, I, I'm not sure if that question's for AZ or for, for Virginia at CDC. I think given that it was about produ informing production, I, I was going to defer to, to AC. <laughs> <Right. Okay. laughs> and, and maybe I'll get started. I don't know if this goes on. And obviously, we work uh, very closely with our partner, uh, Sanofi, who really is um, in charge of allocating supply and, and giving us those estimates in, in our partnership. Um, but I think, you know, in preparation for this, quite a bit of work was done. Um, and you know the the um, you know what we're dealing with here is a situation where the the demand was really unprecedented, as we said before. Um, that being said, I think lots of lessons learned from uh, implementation uh, this season, both here in the U.S. and around the world, that we could take forward uh, in terms of how we plan for the future, as we've discussed. But also, you know, lessons learned for for other vaccine rollouts. So. I think at this point, I prefer not to look backwards, but to look forwards and say, we've learned a lot um, in the partnership and working with all the stakeholders to get the best inputs necessary. But, but definitely, you know, having dealt with something so unusual, I think we've, and unprecedented, we have a good path uh, to move forward. So that's, that's kind of where I would leave it, um, informed by all the tools as, you, as you've suggested. Um, Eskra, I don't know if you have anything you'd want to add. Maybe just then, and and you cover it perfectly. But I think that there is just kind of one 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 perspective that that we need to kind of remind ourselves, and you know, especially when we think about the kind of what were the benchmark and kind of what what were the kind of other examples that could inform the decision. I think we, we kind of tend to forget that you know, uh, nirsemimab is the the first passive immunization, long acting monoclonal antibody, that was approved and 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 you know recommended by ACAP and vaccine fund in a kind of you know unprecedentedly fast way manner, and it's a kind of first time when we actually had an example of the monoclonal passive immunization that is recommended for the all infants. So kind of, you know, in, in one way, you know, pioneering and, and kind of, you know, pr providing the better prevention is always, a, a, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously a privilege to be able to do so. But on the other hand, you know, that also means that you need to kind of, you know, create everything from the scratch and there are not many benchmarks that 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 are kind of useful when you are when you are doing something that is kind of first time so i think that's also the perspective we need to uh, to some extent keep in mind which is why we believe that this planning and kind of joint alignment around kind of how we expect this uptake and immunization uh, to to happen was an important topic. And again, as pointed out already, uh, this is definitely a big learning while we believe that uh, it is something that should be incorporated in the in the in the future planning for this type of uh, medicines. I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, I will take the chair's prerogative and and throw out a a, a bit of a, uh, a a question to contemplate as we think about next season. And nirsevimab and RSV prevention, you know the the big demand that we had this year is heartening as well as as much as it's been a challenge, but I think that's going to make it even a bit more challenging to think about the high risk children in the second year, as well as planning for a new cohort of children, and all of our strategies around RSV prevention for uh, children, pregnant women, prenatal vaccination, as well as our older adult population. So. Uh, great that we have tools available now that we haven't had in the past, uh, but certainly lots of uh, challenges for those forecasting and planning to, to build robust supply for all in need with that equity lens. So I want to thank all of the members of this panel. Uh, it's been a, been a great uh, presentation. I've learned a great deal myself. Uh, we're now going to turn to our next panel. Uh, our next panel is a cornerstone in childhood immunizations, state policies for school entry. According to the National Council of State Legislatures, all 50 states have legislation requiring specified vaccines for children. Uh, although exemptions vary from state to state, all school immunization laws grant exemptions to children for medical reasons. 
there are 45 states in Washington, D.C. that grant religious exemptions for people who have religious objections to immunizations, and 15 states allow philosophical exemptions for children. In this session, our speakers will review new changes in vaccine policies and discuss real-life approaches used in two states, as well as enforcement and legal options more broadly. Our speakers for this panel include Darlene Huang Briggs from Act for Public Health Initiative, Dr. Georgina Peacock from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Jennifer Fulcher from the Mississippi Department of Health, and Dr. Dorit Rubenstein Rice from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, our first presenter, I believe, is Darlene Wang Briggs. Uh, Ms. Briggs, or Dr. Briggs, your slides are up. You have the floor. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Um, and thank you to the committee for the invitation to be here with you all today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darlene Wang Briggs, and I am with the Network for Public Health Law. We are a national organization using the tools of law and policy to promote and improve the public's health and advance health equity. We do that primarily through the provision of legal technical assistance and training to state and local health departments and advocates and the creation of resources. So I am going to provide an overview of navigating the ever evolving vaccine policy landscape as it relates to school immunization requirements. Um, and I actually come to this work not through a vaccine specific lens, but through co-leading the network efforts related to Act for Public Health, which, next slide please, is a collaborative partnership among the public health law organizations you see here. During the pandemic, we came together to track and address the various attacks in state legislatures and courts across the country against the various uses of public health authority, especially emergency authority, to mitigate the wrath of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So the network, in partnership with the National Association of County and City Health Officials, documented the coordinated backlash against public health authority in state legislatures in these early reports. We saw efforts to outright prohibit or shift or limit fundamental public health powers and more generally to upset the balance of those powers for the collective good with individual liberties. These efforts happened across the country and were successful in rolling back public health powers in over half of states. Think things like bans on employer vaccination requirements or mask mandates, as well as blocking the use of business closures or quarantine and shifting power from the executive branch to the legislature for decisions that require public health expertise. And it will come as no surprise to all of you, but the very clear through line Act for Public Health saw in all of these efforts to undermine public health expertise was that vaccines continue to be a target and a bellwether for navigating changes to public health authority more generally. So next slide, please. Last year, we narrowed our legislative tracking focus to a subset of vaccine bills. Um, and what you're seeing here is that data set from our friends at Temple University's Center for Public Health Law Research. They have systematically coded and visually mapped school vaccine and provider scope of practice bills identified by the Association for State and Territorial Health Officials from January to May of last year. They're currently working on an update through the end of 2023. Um, and so what have they found? Next slide, please. Out of 196 total bills introduced, which sought to change existing school entry requirements and the availability of non-medical exemptions and to revisit who determines which vaccines are required for school entry, only 11 of those bills were ultimately enacted. Most expanded the scope of practice for additional healthcare providers to administer vaccines, and just three prohibited uh, various school entry vaccination requirements. Next slide, please. And what was the breakdown between bills promoting versus limiting vaccination? Well, our colleagues at Temple have mapped this for us with um, the darker shades of pink and deep red here representing states where more bills were introduced. For bills promoting vaccination, we saw over half of states introducing at least one bill, with only a couple of states introducing five or more vaccine promoting bills. 
Next slide, please. <clears throat> and despite the low enactment rate of bills introduced in the first half of May, the number of states introducing bills limiting vaccination outpaced the number of states introducing bills promoting vaccination. So here you can see a strong majority of state legislatures had bills introduced that would limit vaccination. You can also see the darker shades of pink and deep red here across more states. What's the bottom line from this map here? The low enactment rate of bills seeking to limit vaccination is not for a lack of trying. We know the success of public health advocates in defeating these proposals for now is incredibly hard work. Um, and we'll be tracking these same efforts this year as well. I also want to note that um, we are starting to hear more and more about regulatory efforts to adopt policies limiting vaccination um, that did not make it through state legislatures. So that will be another front to keep your eyes on this year. Next slide, please. Turning to the courts, um, there are a number of more recent troubling trends to the use of public health authority and for vaccine, man vaccine mandates specifically. The free exercise clause of the First Amendment is at the center of these legal challenges. My colleague Wendy Parnett with Northeastern University's um, Public Health Law Watch likes to start at the beginning where the legal basis for vaccine mandates um, without religious exemptions were on strong legal footing under a set of cases that she likes to call three-legged stool. So these cases bolstered one another and pre-pandemic, almost all traditional public health laws, including vaccine mandates that were neutral laws of general applicability and did not target religion, usually passed constitutional muster. However, there are federal and state statutory or subconstitutional protections for individuals with religious objections, including federal and state religious freedom restoration acts and Title VII's requirement that private employers accommodate religious objector employees. Next slide, please. So when COVID hit, the floodgates to the courts opened up, and while overwhelmingly courts upheld most challenges to state public health actions, there were a few important exceptions with the free exercise cases, which have destabilized the once solid legal footing of that three-legged stool. To generalize, uh, what we saw during the pandemic was a decline of deference to public health expertise, especially, um, but not only in the federal courts, in the spring of 2020, in the South Bay case, the Supreme Court appeared to be following Jacobson's grant of a significant degree of deference to public health officials by refusing to grant an injunction to block a California order limiting in-person worship. But after Justice, Barris re Justice Barrett replaced Justice Ginsburg on the high court, the majority never again cited Jacobson and began offering far less to zero deference to health officials. Next slide, please. The impact of these developments on childhood vaccines is essentially an ominous open door for more potentially successful challenges to state vaccine mandates. My public health law watch colleagues have identified a couple of concerning cases here in Mississippi and Maine one of which we may hear more about later in the panel. Um, there is also ongoing litigation in Connecticut, which in the We the Patriots case out of the Second Circuit, most recently went the other way, upholding the state's 2021 law, eliminating religious exemptions. Next slide, please. So what does this all boil down to? This is the map that you hear Dr. Hopkins sort of describe from the National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, it was last updated in August of 2023 with a count of 45 states, DC, and four territories providing for non-medical exemptions from school immunization requirements. So next slide, please. With that, um, I'll just end with some information about how to get in touch with the Act of Public Health Initiative if you have questions or need assist assistance. Um, and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Briggs. Our next presenter is Dr. Georgina Peacock from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Dr. Peacock, your slides are up. I see your uh, image. Uh, you have the floor. 
All right. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me here today. So um, I'm Georgina Peacock. I'm the director of the Immunization Services Division at CDC. And I really appreciate you having me here to discuss increasing vaccination coverage among children in kindergarten. Next slide. So just very briefly, um, the Immunization Services Division sits in the National Center on Immunization and Respiratory Diseases with a mission, uh, or I'm sorry, a vision to increase vaccination coverage to support healthier living for all. Next slide. So we do this um, through a number of different activities, including um, increasing vaccine access, promoting vaccine confidence and demand, enhancing data research and evaluation, strengthening program support for partners, improving vaccine equity, and enhancing vaccine vaccination response readiness. And you'll see mention of a number of these things as I go through the next couple slides. Next slide. So to address today's topic on increasing vaccination coverage for kindergartners, I'm just going to start off by talking about how high vaccination coverage matters for families and schools. Next slide. So vaccinations optimize school health, school student health. Sorry, um, convenient access to immunizations allows students to maintain optimal health, and immunity to vaccine preventable diseases means smaller outbreaks in schools, fewer missed school days for teachers and students due to illness. Next slide. So according to this CDC research that was conducted in 2023. Disease outbreaks in schools can have significant consequences. So influenza-like Ill illnesses uh, can lead students and teachers to miss between three and five days of school per illness. And if unvaccinated students miss quarantine due to a measles exposure, they would need to miss even more days of school, such as up to 21 days of school. If influenza-like illnesses are severe enough to warrant school closures, the data shows that most school closures for public schools lasted an average of about two days, and the average productivity cost per closure was about $53,000. Next slide. So drops in vaccine coverage put schools at risk for exponentially larger disease outbreaks. Measles, as you know, um, and as we're hearing in the media, is a highly contagious virus. And when children are not up to date on their vaccinations, measles can easily spread in the school environment. A 5% decrease in vaccination rates was associated with a 40 to 4,000% increase in potential outbreak size, and a 5% decrease in vaccination rates has been estimated to cause a tripling of measles cases in children 2 to 11 years of age. Next slide. So when we look at even missing a few days in school, that can negatively affect a student's academic performance. Measles and other disease outbreaks are a threat to children's uh, school performance. And we know that um, if we look at uh, what the National Center on Children in Poverty uh, said, the chronic absence in kindergarten predicts the lowest levels of educational achievement at the end of fifth grade for poor children. In addition, this table from the National Center on Educational Statistics shows that the number of children who meet uh, at or above basic level for mathematics notably decreases with just one to two absences in a month. Next slide. So now I'm transitioning and uh, we'll uh, talk about how the pandemic has affected our routine school vaccination among kindergartners. Next slide. So this shows um, our vaccines for children provider orders, and we use those in, in, as one of the indicators to look at coverage levels. So after the COVID-19 pandemic, orders decreased significantly by about 18.5%. And since then, orders have rebounded and returned to the FY uh, fiscal year 17 and 18 levels. Um, so that is promising that we're seeing that, but I'm going to go into a little more detail on what we've seen in some of the uh, kindergarten coverage um, when we look at that assessment. Next slide. 
So when we uh, look at um, the vaccine coverage, um, we can see that there has been um, a decrease, um, and it's a steady decline in vaccination coverage among kindergartners during the pandemic. So you'll see here, um, in comparison to 2019-2020 levels up to 2022-23 levels, we've seen an observed 2% drop in kindergarten vaccine coverage since the start of the pandemic. So this means um, or, or correlates with about a 725,000 children who entered kindergarten during the pandemic that are susceptible to vaccine preventable diseases. Next slide. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've noticed decreases in kindergarten enrollment. The most dramatic decrease occurred from 2020 to 2021 at 10%, but the recent school year is still down by 4.8%. So that also, um, uh, you know, that, that's a group of children that we actually don't know whether the, they are vaccinated because we look at vaccinations in kindergartners based on those who are actually enrolling in school in kindergarten. We've also noticed uh, increases in the grace period or provisional enrollment and exemption rates. So a grace period allows children to attend school without proof of complete vaccination or have an exemption during a set number of days. Provisional enrollment allows children to attend school while completing uh, catch-up in vaccination schedules, and we've seen increases in both of those. Children not attending kindergarten or attending under a grace period or provisional enrollment also has a negative effect on vaccine coverage. Next slide. So nationwide, 3.9% of kindergarten students were not fully vaccinated and were not exempt. So 10 states reported that greater than 5% of kindergartners were exempt. All other states but these 10 states could potentially achieve that 95% MMR coverage if all the non-exempt children and the not up-to-date children were vaccinated. Uh, and that is a big increase from 2021-22 when we saw that in four states. Next slide. So in summary, uh, nationwide vaccination coverage among kindergarten students remains uh, below um, pre-pandemic levels. There has been an increase in exemptions in 40 states. Uh, it, uh, un it's unclear if this represents a true increase uh, of opposition to vaccination or if parents are opting for um, non-medical exemptions because of barriers to vaccination or out of convenience, meaning it's easier to sort of say, you know, I'm claiming an exemption so you don't have to report um, those vaccinations to the school. So we, we don't, we're not able to look at that. Um, Understanding the reasons behind non-medical exemptions could help to develop policies to increase vaccination. Exemptions greater than the 5% limit of the uh, level achie achievable for vaccination coverage, which increases the risk of outbreaks for vaccine preventable diseases. So there are strategies that schools, clinicians, and public health can implement to ensure that children are fully uh, vaccinated before school entry. Next slide. So now I'll discuss a few of these strategies in the next slides. Next, uh, next slide. So at the state and local level, enforcing school immunization requirements is really a key strategy to encouraging vaccination uh, catch-up. And school immunization requirements were enacted and enforced in 1977 and really were a driving force behind high immunization rates in schools before the COVID-19 pandemic. These requirements have played a significant role in uh, measles being declared eliminated in 2000. And obviously what we're seeing um, today, you know, in, in the media um, and in different places um, does raise some concerns. Uh, but we know that when MMR uh, vaccination coverage drops below 95%, communities are at risk for outbreaks. Next slide. At the federal level, CDC is employing many different strategies to encourage catch-up on routine childhood immunizations, and these include a number of social media. This is a social media campaign, the Let's Play Catch-Up ads. 
that we also developed some call to actions and toolkits and resources for clinicians. We publish a catch-up immunization schedule and also um, conduct, conduct routine immunization campaigns during National Immunization Awareness Month, which happens in August, which is right before or right at the beginning of when children start school. Next slide. In addition, uh, we developed uh, an initiative um, in January of 2023 called the Routine Immunizations on Schedule for Everyone or the Let's Rise initiative. Um, this supports catch up across the lifespan and focuses on developing a framework and working with providers, health departments, public health and community partners, schools, child care centers, all to address these pandemic related declines in vaccinations. Uh, we don't have additional funding for this, but we do prioritize the creation and, and targeting of existing resources and activities to communities and schools that have fallen behind on their vaccinations. And so one of the things we do is work with um, specific uh, state health departments when we're, and help them look at their data and help them look at the places where they need to target their activities and resources um, so that uh, that can be optimized. Next slide. So as part of the Let's Rise initiative, we also encourage partners to prioritize ensuring that everyone catch up, catches up on routine vaccination um, and then identifies individuals that are behind on vaccinations using uh, vaccination catch up um, motivations such as reminders, recalls, outreach, and then um, uh, making sure that vaccines continue to be available and affordable through um, the Vaccines for Children program. So making sure that there are enough providers and also that um, children are receiving vaccines through that. Um, and uh, I think that's it. So I'll go to my next slide and thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter is Jennifer Folker from the Mississippi Department of Health. Right, Jennifer, your slides are up, and I see you on the video. You need to unmute yourself, please. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Jennifer Fulcher. I am the Director of Office of Communicable Diseases here at the Mississippi State Department of Health. Um, and I would have I was previously the Director of Immunizations for the Mississippi State Department of Health. So I was just going to talk to you a little bit about what we've seen in the past year. Uh, related to our immunization laws and uh, what we have put in place. In April of 2023, an injunction was filed in the Federal District Court, the uh, Southern, Southern District of Mississippi, where the plaintiff argued that the law, violate, the, the law violated their right to free exercise of religion um, that was guaranteed by the First Amendment. Our attorney general for the state agreed that the religious exemption was required, but she cited that it was mandated through the Mississippi Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So through that uh, injunction, they required us to submit a plan to, um, to uh, have religious exemptions in place for our state and to have that available by July the 15th of 2023. So we, um, we mimicked our uh, medical exemption process. So uh, anyone that was seeking a religious exemption would have to go through a centralized system, our health departments. Uh, they would have to watch an educational video, be educated on vaccinations. And then they would have to sign uh, a form saying that they knew uh, what the, um, that there was any indication that they knew uh, the, um, what my word, <laughs> um, any, that they would have to sign a form saying that they were agreeing to this. So we uh, presented that back to the court in July. Uh, on July the 7th, they agreed with what we put in place. And so we now have a religious exemption process based on uh, a court. So our law did not change, but the court um, actually made that decision. 
previously we've had very high vaccination rates in our schools. Uh, last year, it was 99.1% of our school age children were vaccinated. Uh, and we had a total of 428 uh, medical exemptions of those who were enrolled. Currently this year, just through the religious exemption process, we've seen around 2,500 religious exemption requests come through our health departments. Um, we will be finalizing our school report soon to see how many children actually enrolled into, the, into school with these religious exemptions. After um, reviewing the numbers, we will have more information about where those actually lie in our state, if they're, they're centralized to a, a certain region, or if they if, uh, have any, if we could see any trends on where this is going or and how we can address this. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Jennifer. We'll now move to our last member of the panel. Uh, our last panelist is Dr. Dora Rubenstein Rice from the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Rice, your slides are up. Can you hear me? Uh, I hear you. I see your note that you're unable to start your video. Uh, you're loud and quick. Please okay. Proceed. Thank you. Wonderful. Right now I should be able to. So um, the nice thing about going after everybody is that I can build on what my co-panelists uh, mentioned. Um, can you move to the next slide? I have two disclosures. We own stock in GSK and I served as a volunteer on Moderna's COVID-19 ethics advisory group. Next slide. I'll be covering the enforcement option and especially the legal enforcement option in relation to COVID-19 vaccines. I hope that one of the take homes from Dr. Peacock's presentation was that there's a lot of other things that are going on in terms of vaccine rates besides the law itself. And there are other things that we should do to increase vaccine rates besides change the law or enforce the law, including information and access issues. But I will be talking a little bit generally about the legal issues, a little bit generally about requirements, about, I will mention some options to time procedures and some limits on them, some options to affect the content of exemptions, and then some other things. Next slide. So um, legally speaking, I hope you've already realized that the main area of activity in relation to exemptions from school immunization requirements is the First Amendment and religious uh, issues. Next. Um, keep in mind that we've discussed on whether, uh, mostly whether the First Amendment allows or disallows religious exemptions, but if it it's relevant, it might also affect which procedures you can ask them. Next slide. Uh, next uh, point. Um, I, it may not have come across clearly, but there's legal uncertainty on whether the courts are currently requiring a religious exemption. Next point. Uh, and whether, if they are requiring religious exemption, you can uh, burden that uh, exemption with procedural requirement. Next point. Um, thank you. Uh, next next point. I, um, I don't think I can do this. Um, next point. If uh, you're putting the same burden on a religious exemption and a medical exemption, for example, if you're requiring a doctor's signature on a medical exemption, you can put the same requirement on a religious exemption. But it's not clear that that's true if you only want to put the burden on the religious exemption. It is clear that you don't have to give a non-religious exemption. So you don't have to give a personal belief exemption. Next slide. Um, Dr. Peacock has highlighted that lower vaccine rates mean that you um, have more outbreaks, but I want to connect it to the law next. Uh, by uh, mentioning that easier to obtain, obtain ex exemptions, extensive literature shows that easier to obtain exemptions means there are more exemptions and more outbreaks. 
uh, in a state. Um, one of the questions in the chat was about a recent study that looked at COVID-19 vaccine mandates in states, uh, but for school immunization requirement, unlike for those mandates, we have a large literature that shows that easier laws lead to more exemptions and more outbreaks. There's a range of procedural options available that I'll cover in the next slide, but keep in mind that if there are limits on religion, uh, that uh, on religious exemption, they may limit which procedures you can require. And also keep in mind that procedural requirements help uh, reduce exemptions, but people who are strongly anti-vaccine will still get an exemption, whatever the procedure is. Also remember that if you're adding procedural or content requirements, uh, they tend to have a regressive impact. In other words, it's easier for, for the privileged to follow procedures, for example, to get a notary signature than for people who are less privileged. It's always a balance. You want less exemptions, but you need to keep equity in mind as you put in place requirements. What can you do procedurally? And I'm taking this from an article from 2015. It has not changed by uh, Professors Young and Silverman. You can, um, first of all, require a specific form. Some states have what are colloquially called napkin exemptions, where you can submit anything to require the exemption. Some states require you to submit a specific form, and that's a little more demanding. You can uh, allow the exemption to be submitted online, which is easier or require a paper to be delivered. You can require notarization, which adds a burden. You can uh, make a requirement that exemptions will be filed annually. In its recent change in the law, Colorado changed the exemption requirement from filing it once to an annual uh, filing of exemption. Again, more burden means less exemptions. And you can require an educational component. Some states require a signature of a doctor that you've discussed the benefits and risks of the uh, vaccines. Some states have an online module and some states let you choose. So all of these can add requirements to the exemption process. Um, in Michigan, the state uh, tightened its school immunization mandate to require that people asking for exemption visit the health department and have a discussion with a member of the health department before getting the exemption. The health department can't refuse an exemption, but uh, they, there has to be that visit first. Finally, and I'll repeat this in the next slide, you can require an explanation for an exemption. And if you require that kind of um, explanation, it, it again puts a little more burden. And I think Dr. Fulcher also made the point for us that uh, stronger vaccine laws mean less exemption. Uh, Dr. Fulcher mentioned that Mississippi was required by a court to put in place an exemption process, but I would point out that Mississippi put in place a procedurally demanding exemption process, uh, which makes it harder to get an exemption than some other states, although they're still moving away from their excellent previous vaccine coverage, which was a model to other states. What can you do in terms of content? Again, if you require an explanation of the reasons for an exemption, that's not just a procedural burden. It may give the officials a chance to counter some of the arguments raised for an exemption and respond to them. Some states allow you to submit blood work uh, or evidence that the student had at least some diseases as an alternative to vaccination. For example, for chickenpox, um, uh, more rarely for measles, uh, and that's another way to uh, address exemptions. A trickier area is, can you assess the sincerity of religious exemptions? As mentioned, the courts may be moving to require more religious exemption. The jurisprudence of that is confusing. Uh, Dep Deputy Director Briggs mentioned Mississippi and Maine as examples of cases where the courts tightened the uh, requirements by requiring a religious exemption, but other courts went the other way. Other courts said you don't have to have a religious exemption from these mandates. Uh, one of the challenges is if you do give a religious exemption, how do you assess whether the person is sincere? And that's tricky because there's a lot of evidence that most people that refuse vaccine are not acting out of religious reasons. They're acting out of safety concerns, often not well-founded safety concerns, or out of an, their assessment of the risk and benefits. There are some, at least some of them are reaching for religion as a crutch. That's a problem because 
first of all, no religion wants to be used this way. And second, um, it requires a state to try and assess who is speaking the truth and who is speaking less true. The jurisprudence makes it hard to police sincerity of religious exemption. There's some things a state can't do. You can't require a letter from a religious leader because that discriminates against people from a non-organized religion who have sincere belief but are not part of a religious religion. This makes it harder to police because requiring a letter from a religious leader gives some kind of oversight over the claim. Um, you cannot limit um, this to whether your organized religion opposes vaccines. So for example, Catholics that have opposition to vaccines may raise a sincere religious objection, even, if the, even though the Pope supports vaccines. Uh, again, that's harder to police. How do you know if the person is really concerned about religion or concerned about something else? And finally, you cannot assess the reasonableness of the uh, religious objection because it's not the state's job to police whether religious beliefs make sense. To give an extreme and unrealistic example, if your person says that they believe in the invisible pink unicorn and that they cannot have their skin pricked by anything but the horn intentionally, and if they're sincere, you have to accept it. Um, that makes religious uh, uh, exemptions very hard to police. Other things to keep in mind in terms of enforcement. First of all, um, as Dr. Peacock mentioned, it's not just the law that's in play here. A big question about um, vaccine access is the issue of um, access, uh, about, about vaccine uptake is the issue of access. So one of the questions is, uh, how, do you how do you balance this? Maybe one way to do it is to provide school clinics, but vaccine opponents tend to oppose school clinics as well because they're concerned about people, be children being vaccinated uh, in spite of the parents' objections, four may be left and things like that. On the other hand, school clinics may be a way to bring vaccines to people who uh, would otherwise have real access problems. Uh, another issue is that we depend, and Dr. Peacock uh, uh, referred to that, we depend for knowing vaccine rates on the records. The records may not be complete. So a school that has an apparent high rate of exemption may have students that are vaccinated, but they have incomplete records. So in a state that's where exemptions are easy to get, the parents might have just filed an exemption rather than go get the records. So in some places, one way to improve vaccine rates, at least on the surface, is to solve record issues. Um, another thing is that there are students who will not have complete vaccination records, whether they're vaccinated or not. And that includes students who are homeless, students from fellow military families who move around and the records may not always follow. Uh, although most states have immunization registries, those tend not to talk to each other. So rec again, going back to the records, that might be an issue. Um, many states do not want to leave students with these kinds of issues outside school. M many of the students will be vaccinated, just have record issues. So many states treats homeless students or students from military families differently. And finally, again, going back to something that Dr. Pico raised, there's the issue of conditional entrance. In uh, most states, um, there's a provision for allowing students that started to get vaccines uh, or that got some but not all vaccines to catch up. So those entrants will have some immunization, they won't have all. It's especially true for uh, uh, places that have series. Uh, so uh, for vaccines that have uh, series. So if you get the first vaccine, it then takes a few months. And those schools will allow the student to start as long as they catch up. So this conditional entrance uh, will have a grace period to finish the problem. And one of the things that might happen in states is that uh, there's no enforcement, there's no follow up, and there's no catch up. The last thing I'll say about enforcement here is uh, what is the consequence if a student is exempt and there's an outbreak? And that's something that's come up in many states. States have laws that allow taking the students that are exempt, including medical exemptions and religious exemptions, out of school for the period of the outbreak. That protects the student who is at high risk of getting the disease they're not immunized again and can help limit the outbreak. Uh, those laws work if they're enforced. They have been previously legally challenged, and so far those challenges have been uh, rejected. 
because that's the other side of a, a, a taking an exemption. You agree to be taken out of school if there's an outbreak. Uh, but we can expect more challenges to these kinds of uh, enforcement provision as well. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to follow up with additional uh, answers to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Rice. So are there any questions or comments from uh, members of the committee or liaisons? Jeff Ditch, please. Thank you uh, for those great presentations. I have two questions. Um, the first is um, about what we know, if you can share a bit about what we know related to exemptions, under immunized, non immunized, outside of public school settings, because most of the talks today were focused on public school settings. And we know that even in communities with very high overall coverage, these pockets of under immunized people, whether they're school associated or some other community associated um, are very dangerous with respect to vulnerability to outbreaks. Um, so that's one question. And then what, what were your strategies you, know, you recommend to address those settings? And then my second question is, if you could take a look at the article I put in the chat recently about unintended consequences of COVID-19 vaccine mandates from the University of Arizona. And I'm particularly interested in whether our CDC colleagues feel that this is an appropriate um, analysis because it used all CDC data and what you think of the um, reliability of the conclusions and same question for others as well. Thank you very much. So I can answer your second question first. I'll need to take it and I think get back to you because I'll need to review it more closely um, and talk with some of our um, some of our scientists back at CDC. I think that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rice, please. Um, for your first question, two things. First, in most states, uh, private schools are also covered by the same immunization laws as public schools. Or, uh, and the question is, what are the exemptions and how they apply? Uh, homeschoolers are less covered. There's only a couple of states that would apply the same policies to homeschoolers, and those states have pretty wide open exemptions. So. One in theory, one thing you could do is uh, apply immunization law across settings, including to homeschool, uh, and consider whether to tighten exemptions for those settings as well. Another thing is really um, part of the issue is what's going on in underimmunized community. For example, one of my colleagues in uh, New York who's addressing their uh, Jewish Orthodox community points out that although there's also hesitancy, a big problem there is access. If you have one clinic, and there's a line and you have to take two hours to immunize and um, to wait in line and then immunize eight kids that's a big problem so um in under immunized pockets a big issue a big a big thing that needs to be done is identify why there's a uh, low vaccination rates and address those uh, uh, reasons which may be confidence or may be access thank you it if I may just comment on the study that is in um, the chat, um, this is also the first I've seen of it, so I'd want to take a closer look at it. Um, but one of the things that I know um, does really impact some of the um, analyses of these types of studies is looking at what the actual mandates were, uh, what the coverage of them was, what effective dates um, actually uh, were in place, whether that overlaps with the data um, for outcomes that they're looking at. Um, as well as sort of enforcement mechanisms and what sort of communication happened to the public about um, the enforcement of those uh, mandates. So again, it's something that I would want to take back and look at, um, but just wanted to throw that out there. And thank you for that. And I would be very interested in your assessment after you have time to look it over more carefully. I see Rob Schechter has uh, put some more data in the chat uh, also for folks to look at. Uh, often, often we get some nice uh, offline uh, information there as well. Are there other questions or comments from others? I was just going to comment that in Mississippi, our homeschool population is not covered by our exemption law. I mean, our immunization law. So they so they are exempt. They, they do not have to follow the same rules that our public and private schools do. So um, we are in our legislative sessions and I've seen uh, several bills come across that are um, 
wanting to include those homeschool children in therapies through public school and through school sports. Uh, so if that is the case, the, the way they're currently written uh, discusses, uh, they would have to meet all the same requirements as an enrolled student, which would be vaccination. Other questions or comments from the members of the panel? You know, this this is a really thorny issue, you know, on two sides. You know, the the you want to enforce to protect the health of these kids and their families, but at the same time, you want don't want it to be seen as uh, threatening. Uh, it really is a really is a big challenge. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions or comments. I want to thank you all very much for your presentations. This was uh, was very enlightening, and uh, uh, I must admit, I, I, I learned more a lot, even on the legal side of things, which uh, which my father will be very happy for, uh, since I ignored that at all of my raising. Uh, but uh, but thank you again for your presentations. Uh, at this time, uh, we're actually running a little early. Uh, despite uh, uh, my management of time to this point, uh, uh, we will go to break. Uh, we were scheduled to go to break at uh, 4 p.m. So we will go to break, it's now 3.45 p.m. And we will come back uh, at um, 4.15 p.m. Eastern time uh, and start with our next panel, which is celebrating 30 years of saving lives, the Vaccines for Children program now and in the future. Uh, and after that, we will have the presentation by our Innovation and Immunization Subcommittee update. I want to thank all of you for joining us for our February 22, 23, 2024 National Vaccine Advisory Committee. And we will see you back uh, after the break at 4.15 Eastern Time. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.